Welcome to the 2021 Commonwealth Short Story Prize. I'm your host, Donna Kroll. Thank you all for joining us from your many different time zones around the world to celebrate the regional winners and overall winner of this year's prize. This is our 10th birthday and we're marking the occasion here at the London Library, home to a million books dating back to the 15th century that has served as inspiration to countless readers and writers. It's safe to say it's been a long, difficult year since our last online award ceremony. In times like these, stories are a great way to connect us and to remind us that we are not alone. So please, join us on social media using our hashtag CWPRIZE and say hello to everyone in the chat. The Commonwealth Short Story Prize is the most global of all literary prizes. It's free to enter and open to citizens from all 54 Commonwealth countries, a total of 2.4 billion people. This year, we received over 6,000 unpublished short stories in 11 different languages, Every one of these was read by a dedicated team of readers from around the world. A long list of 200 stories was drawn up and sent to our international judging panel, who then had the enjoyable, if difficult, task of selecting a short list of 25. This year's judges are Igoni Barrett, Africa, Kadmul Islam, Asia, Keith Jarrett, Canada and Europe. Diana McCauley, Caribbean. Tina Macaretti, Pacific. The chair of the judges is Zoe Wickham. From the shortlist, the judges selected five outstanding regional winners. Remy Gamage, Africa. You know, you're the winner of the Africa Region Prize for the 2021 Commonwealth Short Story Prize. Yes. Yeah, yo, yo, I, I... Kanya Dalmeda, Asia. And it's my extreme and great pleasure to inform you that you have actually won the Asia Regional Award. Yeah. <laughs> Carol Farrelly, Canada and Europe. Congratulations on being the regional winner. Um, oh my God. <laughs> story. Um, <laughs> it's absolutely incredible. Oh, that's amazing. <laughs> Thank you so much. That's brilliant. <laughs> I don't know what to say. Roland Watson Grant, Caribbean. You are the regional winner for the Caribbean. <laughs> people, people don't get these emotions out of me. Okay, but well, this one. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Katerina Gibson, Pacific. We'd actually like to name your story as the um, winner of the Pacific Region uh, Commonwealth Short Story Prize. <laughs> Each regional winner receives an award of £2,500 and the overall winner receives £5,000. Our partners here at the London Library are also giving each regional winner a one-year full individual membership, granting them in-person and remote access to all the library's resources. This year's overall winner receives a two-year full individual membership. We're very grateful to the London Library for their generous offer. To hear more about this fabulous location, we're joined now by the director, Philip Marshall. Well, the London Library has been a centre of creativity, inspiration and ideas for 180 years. We have a collection of around a million books here and some wonderful spaces to sit, to read and write. That's why the Library has always been a tremendous resource for writers, from Charles Dickens and Virginia Woolf to Tom Stoppard and Sarah Waters. In recent years, we've also developed a vast online collection of journals and e-books, and we regularly stream discussion events with writers talking about their work, so there's a great deal of inspiration and support on offer to our readers and writers wherever they might be in the world. We are absolutely delighted to be supporting the Commonwealth Short Story Prize and look forward to welcoming all of the regional winners to the London Library community. Thank you, Philip. I'm tempted to join myself. 
Before we meet the first of our five regional winners, let's take a quick look at what's coming up. We look behind the scenes at the judging process, meet the regional winners, hear exclusive readings of the winning stories by some very special guests, catch up with last year's winner, Kritika Pandey, and, of course, announce the overall winner of this year's Commonwealth Short Story Prize. Now, I'd like to introduce you to the first of this year's regional winners, Remy Ngamiji from Namibia, who has won the regional prize for Africa for his story, Granddaughter of the Octopus. Being a part of this year's Commonwealth Short Story Prize was amazing. It was the very first time in Namibia's history that a writer from our community had been recognized at this level. My hope really is that this inspires more Namibian writers and writers from less established literary traditions to write, submit their short stories, and take part in this global storytelling event. My short story, Granddaughter of the Octopus, follows three generations of women through love, war, and dispossession. At its heart, it follows a grandmother who tries to make her life according to her own terms in some of the harshest and most challenging environments a woman can face. When I wrote this short story, the grandmother sounded a certain way. She walked in a particular manner. The things that she did, the things that she thought, made sense in my head in a particular way. But the joy of storytelling is that once you put a story on paper, a reader comes along and interprets it in their own way. This is why I'm absolutely delighted to have my story read by Mubanga Kalima Mukwento from Zambia today. My grandmother was unshamedly uncouth. She'd long lived by herself. Her personality and manners were unkept by the propriety and modesty which defined women in the valley. She had a reputation for being a difficult woman. Years later, when I described her to my eldest son, trying to convey her character to him, he said she was a harridan. I looked up the word, a strict or belligerent old woman. It wasn't her. Even though we lived on a farm with an unending list of chores and duties, she was lenient when the sun was murderous and patient when the rain washed away our best laid plans. She had one law, my children, my family, my house, my farm, my land, my body, my mind, my spirit, my rules. Her fierce possession of these things and her unyielding defense of them is what made her seem overbearing. She'd never go out of her way to make anyone do anything so long as they didn't interfere with what was hers. Her eye only came out when she felt attacked. Her cheeks sucked in air, pumping a bust an opera singer would envy and hurled the blackest curses at any threat. Man, woman, child, neighborhood dog, unscrupulous merchant or thieving farm worker. Once she doused you with her malison, you were marked with cane like shame. Only she had the magic words to return you to the world of the living. She was always eager to do so, bearing down on you, squeezing you into a hug, nearly suffocating you in the barely damned contours of her breasts. My grandmother couldn't be commanded. If you wanted to be labeled as foolish, you begged from her or mistakenly threatened her beyond the point she'd stopped respecting you. This is what happened to the mayor of the town where I grew up. He was a foolish man. Three times he'd tried to get her to sell her land, an amalgamation of fields which spread across the valley to a mining corporation. The first time he came around, he'd been turned away at the gate. The second time, he'd made it as far as her kitchen door before she shooed him away politely. This meant he was sworn at only once. For his last pitch, my grandmother summoned the whole clan together. All my uncles took leave from their jobs in the city to make the long drive home. Even my father, who I hadn't seen in years, made the familial hajj. My uncle's wives were there, as were my cousins who, like me, were all victims of varying degrees of absent husbandry or fatherhood. I always considered this a curious fact. My grandmother knew exactly where her sons were, even if their wives didn't. 
That meeting commanded an attendance register, even weddings and funerals couldn't. A message had gone out. Something might be done with the land. Everyone's inheritance was affected. Everyone answered the summons. Congratulations, Remy. The process of choosing five winners from over 6,000 submissions is a mammoth task, and nobody knows that better than our judges. The chair of the judges, Zoe Wickham, now joins us from Scotland to give us a peek behind the scenes at the negotiations and deliberations that go into the selection process. If settling on a short list was difficult, choosing the regional winners from such a wide variety of stories was the nail-biting part of the competition. By this stage, we had the pleasure of rereading the contenders and also got to know each other um, as readers. So the discussions were lengthy and often heated and sometimes with the widely diverging opinions, but always um, rewarding. Not least because in the process of exchanging ideas, about a work, new meanings or nuances are released. Um, important also seeing the affect of stories on fellow judges. Uh, a chemistry develops and another's response may well move you to reconsider your own. So I'm grateful to the judges who, as you will see, had plenty to say in the process. Please, Today, of yeah. course, we're going to have to achieve two things, which is to choose the regional winners and also our overall winner. When I, got, I mean, even the descriptions that follow in that paragraph, I, I thought were so vivid and, and just pulled me in. And then we get to the grandmother and I'm completely sold at that point. Yes, it, again, it comes down to, to the uh, questions of what a story is, because of course, um, you know, we can argue there are many ways to write a story. And for me, part of what a story is trying to do is to say something, you know, I read a lot, of, a lot of stories through the shortlist, and many of them, some of them very, you know, through the um, submissions, and some of them really well written, left me cold at the end because it wasn't saying anything new. Since only the country of the author is supplied, reading for a competition is unusually reliant on the text itself. Not surprisingly, then, we often disagreed on the meanings and merits of stories. So it was important not only to have the insights of judges with cultural knowledge of the region, but crucially to have no time restrictions on our deliberations. I, I suppose I thought it was just a bit repetitious and... and... I think that's the, the point of it, because it, it just gradually creeps up. There's this person who we know is taking over, and then they do, and then then the cycle continues, and there's the invasives yeah. and the and the conversations which are uncanny and all of that. Like I I thought yeah. just that sense of unease. It was a bit yeah, red. reminded yeah. me of some kind of like Cortasso or something. I mean, I think it's yeah. a bit Adam and Eve, but I don't think it's strictly allegorical. I think it's a yeah. it's a utopian it's a utopia that turns into a dystopia and kind of oh, plays with yeah. the idea. With well, it plays with the idea of if we started again, would we be able to manage these gender relations in a way that um, isn't Adam and Eve like? You know, woman, woman still brings evil into the world by defending us. It's just playing with a lot of really interesting it's, questions. It's fluent. It's fluent writing. You know, the writing just has a fluency. That, that That's beautiful that, writing. Yeah. It may be, it may be but, a reflection yeah. of the struggles that always take place between the world of PC, politically correct, and non-PC. And the yeah, struggle to adjust to and accommodate, yeah, accommodate, accommodate these yeah. things and these parameters. And this, this is the story, of course, in the microcosm, but the larger story is that. And, and the way that it has been framed is it just allows you to laugh at something that can get very tense. It's in kind the, of skewering the, the canon a bit and the way we, we, we all yeah. decide what is good and what is not. It's kind of which, skewering the which, process. Which the author has a perfect right to do as long yeah. as it is readable and witty and funny. And I was, it, to me, no, I'm, I'm saying that's a good thing. Out, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. 
Okay. I mean, for I me, see. there was no question. It was the funniest story on this. Yeah, year. yeah, of the whole lot. Now let's meet our second regional winner, Kanya Di Almeida from Sri Lanka, with her short story, I Cleaned the... For many years now, I've been on a mission to acquire, to archive, and sometimes to invent the stories of women that don't get told, particularly in Sri Lanka. And not just any women, the raucous women, the raunchy women, the rebellious, rude, real women, who in some other contexts might simply be called mad women. And so winning the regional award for Asia is like a gift. It's the gift of being able to share these stories, these women, with a world of readers that I might not have otherwise dreamt of being able to reach. This story, I Cleaned the, revolves around a character who spent 20 years cleaning human waste and is now recounting her life story to an old spinster in a home for forsaken women. And I'm so thrilled that the excerpt you're about to hear is read by Ranmali Mirchandani. She's a distinguished arts professional, she's an actress, and for 26 years, she was the head of arts for the British Council in Sri Lanka. TB Rita loves the story. I don't know why. It doesn't have a happy ending. She doesn't actually have tuberculosis. The TB stands for tobacco. She says she became addicted to the stuff while wrapping BDs for a living when she was 13 years old. And now her lungs are like the kitchen sponge, full of holes and black fungus. She keeps a small tin cup under her bed for the sputum. When it's full, wobbling at the brim, it reminds me of my old life. Rita's condition doesn't stop her from having what she calls a good bloody laugh at my expense. She's heard the saga so many times, she knows it off by heart. When I get to the part about Chuti Baba's funeral, she starts to giggle. As I proceed towards the dreadful climax, her giggle turns into a cackle and then into a cough, that terrible broken lorry engine cough until she is laughing and coughing so hard, there's spittle and blood on her chin. I don't find it funny at all, but I indulge her because she's dying. Rita and I share a room in the Carmelite Sisters Sanctuary for the Forsaken. All the nuns here have taken a vow of silence and spend their days caring for women who've been dismissed abandoned, maimed, or otherwise left for dead. By night, they walk the streets in search of us. That's how they found me, curled against a stone cross in the Catholic quarter of the Borella Cemetery. It took three of them, strong those ladies, to get me away from there. Twenty years I was with Chuti Baba. I couldn't bear to leave her side. Twenty? years of washing one person's backside, Rita calls. You should be on your knees thanking God for releasing you. In a wicked way, she's right. No one should live as Chuti Baba did. But with her gone, I can't get hold of my life. No weight to heft, no hair to comb. I've become a skin with nothing inside. It's helped me fit in here. This is a place for people who have no people. The sanctuary's front garden is full of flowering creepers. The backyard is a private burial ground. Crooked wooden signposts mark each grave, like a bed of vegetables that never grow. I would like to sit quietly on the veranda overlooking this wilting plot of land, but Rita won't let me. She chatters like a trapped squirrel, prodding, probing. Go and bother one of the others, will you? I say. Those boring hags. Their stories are nothing compared to yours. This is a cracker. One of the best things I've heard in my life. 
Wow, such powerful writing. Before we meet our next regional winner, let's hear from Anne Gallagher, the Director General of the Commonwealth Foundation, who joins us now from Australia. I'm so happy to be welcoming you all to the 2021 ceremony for the Commonwealth Short Story Prize. This is a special year for us as we're also celebrating the 10th birthday of this amazing prize. I'm here at the National Library of Australia, formerly the Commonwealth National Library. We are standing on the land of the Ngunnawal people, the first inhabitants of this region. I begin by paying my respects to the custodians and elders of this nation, past, present and emerging. Thank you everyone for joining us. It means so much to the Foundation and of course to our talented regional winners to have you here. The Commonwealth is home to 2.4 billion citizens, around a third of humanity. Our job at the Foundation is to do everything possible to connect the people of the Commonwealth with each other, to make the voices of Commonwealth citizens heard on matters that affect their lives. We're so proud of the prize, not least its truly global outlook. It's wonderful that all the winners are here with us today, from Namibia, Sri Lanka, Scotland, Jamaica and Australia. Our thanks to all the readers and judges who work so hard to find the very best short stories from around the Commonwealth. I still can't believe that it's part of my job to read such wonderful writing. For those who haven't yet encountered the winning stories on Granta, you're in for a treat. And like you, I'm so excited to find out who the winner is. Now, it's my great pleasure to introduce our third regional winner, my fellow Australian, Katarina Gibson, who won the prize for the Pacific region with her exceptional story, Fertile Soil. Congratulations, Katarina. I'm beyond stoked and very moved to get this far in the Commonwealth Writers' Prize. Being a writer in Australia means you have to swim upstream against a lot of anti-art sentiment. But within the writing community, we have such a wonderful and diverse array of writers and readers, and it's an immense privilege to be surrounded by encouraging and talented people. A lot of where I'm coming from as an Australian writer is asking myself not just what I'm writing, but why I get to write it. So it means so much to me that this story has been chosen to represent not just Australia, but the Pacific region, and to get to be a part of this community as well. Fertile Soil is about colonial inheritance, naturalisation, both in nature and in life. I'm asking questions of what it means to be a white settler in a country that is founded on violence, but it's much more literally about a woman coming undone, deja vu, the unsettling feeling of being slowly replaced. So I'm delighted to introduce the lovely, warm Francesca Savage, who has gracefully agreed to read an extract from my story. It fell silent between us while he poured himself a glass of wine and I asked him to forgive me but what was his name? At this point the young man looked up from his pouring for a second I saw his face devastated but we've met he said as his wine glass filled to the brim I thought he said but then his glass over poured and although I tried to apologise, I saw that tears had welled in the corner of his eyes. He then, realising a great quantity of his wine had spilt down his front onto the floor, said, oh God, what a mess, and ran off. He left not to the kitchen, but in the direction of the front door, and I didn't see the young man again. It was instances like this that brought on me a peculiar dawning or feeling of Eurasia like the city was conspiring against me, as if the weather, threatening 40 degrees for three weeks without reprieve, was causing a form of heat stroke that was affecting my short-term memory. My connections to other people seemed tenuous, began to make less and less sense. For days, I fretted over what was causing my disservice to so many people. What had happened that I couldn't remember that sensitive young man? What was making me forget the life details of acquaintances? Or in fact, the acquaintances themselves? And still the encounters went on. 
an old friend texted to say it was lovely running into me. My doctor told me I was already up to date with my pap smear, and when I went into a bookstore on a whim one afternoon, the bookseller smiled and said, back so soon? I began to fear I was developing early onset Alzheimer's until I opened that door one afternoon and saw her chest heaving, rummaging through a backpack. It was at a barbecue. As most parties are in summer in the culmination of the year, alcoholism ran rampant. And the day-to-day -day obligations of routine, of work, of exercise, of appointments were discarded for the condensation collecting on the outside of a bottle. The time of year when the sun goes down, but the heat never lets up. Nor the mosquitoes. The days bleed one day into the next, morphing into one another. Which is to say, I cannot point now precisely to which door it was, which party or whose house I was in when the doorbell rang. I was the only person in the kitchen. All the other guests had retreated to the back deck. I opened the catch and knew immediately, in a sigh of relief. It was not me, but the young man and many other strangers like him that were mistaken. I greeted myself with a small smile. Many congratulations to you, Katerina, for your beautiful work. Over the past 10 years of the Commonwealth Short Story Prize, we have received 43,388 entries from 53 countries. Including this year, we have had 11 winners. Let's take a look at the talented writers who have won the prize over the past 10 years. Now let's catch up with Kritika Pandey to find out what she's been up to since she won the prize in 2020. Winning the Commonwealth Short Story Prize 2020 has opened doors I had not imagined possible at this stage of my career. Apart from signing with a literary agent who shares my vision, I've been invited to give talks, conduct writing workshops, write a range of short prose, and participate in collaborative projects that have opened my eyes to the many different ways of being a writer. Most importantly, because writing and self-doubt are two sides of the same coin, the overall sense of confidence that the prize has instilled in me is something I'd be eternally grateful for. I'd like to introduce the fourth regional winner of this year's prize for Canada and Europe, Carol Farrelly from Scotland, who won for her story, Turnstones. I'm thrilled and honoured to be a regional winner in the 2021 prize. It can be quite a solitary craft writing and it's felt even more solitary this year. But it's always a leap of faith and a wanting to connect. And to me, that's what the Commonwealth Writers is all about. So to win this prize in particular feels special. The judge, Keith Jarrett's comments were so generous and that means the world. And that's always the best reward. A generous reader responding to my story and bringing it alive again. So Turnstones tells the story of a young woman at a prestigious university who is battling the feeling that she doesn't belong. And that feeling for her has a long history, an intergenerational history. It's a story that rails against gatekeepers, but also asks, what do we want to find or make once or if we get beyond those gates? It's also a tale about a flock of birds in a library on a stormy night. I'm so excited that the wonderful actress, Lindsay Marshall, will read an extract from my story. You'll have to go back home, the porter said. Joe stiffened. What? Go get your car if you want inside tonight, but we close in an hour, so... 
He moved to close the rattling door, but a red umbrella sprang out at him. Somebody sighed, unless it was the umbrella closing. A navy blue scarf fluttered to the floor and a gloved hand caught it just in time. A man in a black pork pie hat bustled towards them and as he turned to shut the door, a whole gang of turnstones scurried inside. Her skin crawled with the strangeness of it. One bird stopped by her feet and dunted its beak against her boot. Unimpressed by the tang of wet vegan leather, the bird rejoined its companions as they streamed upstairs. Stocky little waders with fading tortoise shell backs. Snowy white breasts and upturned beaks like small black shovels. They were plentiful enough on the gravelly beaches back home, but it made no sense to see them there. So far inland, penned in by flagstones and shells. The storm must have dragged them off their migratory to course. A breaker-shaped wind had scooped them up and carried them here. A little flotilla. And the library's lights had drawn them inside. Now they'd gained entry where she could not. And it made her both want to laugh and cry. Good evening, Dr Hurley, the porter said to the man as he shook his umbrella. The porter, too preoccupied with Dr Hurley, still hadn't noticed the trespassers. Freak storm, sir, eh? The porter nodded at the window. Never said it would be this first, did they? There'll be trees and roofs down tonight. Dr Hurley, his face still hidden beneath his hat, nodded. Although it's not such a freak, is it? Not anymore, this is our climate now. We'll have to adapt, Derek, or expire like the dinosaurs. Dr Hurley tapped the turnstile with his hat. The porter jumped and buzzed him through without one flash of a card. The man hummed a tune as he climbed the stairs and a bird trailed behind him. He didn't have a card, she said. The porter started humming Dr Hurley's tune. He's one of our most brilliant young scholars. And rules are rules, you said. He turned his back and pulled the handle on the shivering lattice window. Please. She wanted to call him Derek, but she resisted. Can't you let me through? I, I know Dr Hurley, he replied, and I don't know you. Congratulations, Carol. If you'd like to read the winning stories, they've been published by Paper and Ink in a limited edition collection and can be purchased online. You can also read the shortlisted and winning stories on ADA, the Commonwealth Writers' online magazine. And now it's my pleasure to introduce our fifth regional winner, Roland Watson Grant, a fellow Jamaican, who won the Caribbean Regional Prize with his story, The Disappearance of Mumadel. The Disappearance of Mumadel is a story about things vanishing. So many things become invisible in our world. In the name of progress, cultures are marginalized and people are displaced. The story takes place in a rural Jamaican district where mid-funeral, a matriarch's body goes missing. But perhaps the remains of Momadel are not the only things that have gone missing in this corner of the world that's caught between a rich past and a rapacious future. And to read an extract from the disappearance of Momadel, I am more than honored to have the incredible Kai Miller. See, you have to understand, Mrs. Warren. My mother is Zion people. My mother believed that when you're sleeping, you're more conscious than when your two eyes open. She believed that the spirit leave the body and walk around when night comes. So as soon as I start snoring, she believed my spirit jumped through the window and gone straight to the pear tree. So you can imagine how every night she stand up over me and preach it back into the bed. You also have to understand that as far as my mother is concerned, every dream she get is a message from the Most High. 
even if she really did go hard on a plate of stew peas before bedtime. You have to understand that Jacinda Carmela Warren is founder and shepherd mother of the Church of the Living Drum. So whatever spiritual rule she lay down in River Gut is the law on earth as it is in heaven, now and forevermore. Amen and Sela. So I wasn't a stranger to the commandment that nobody should set foot over the train track, even when the pear tree heavy with the plumpest, prettiest, green skin avocados your eyes ever behold on the earth. Because to eat from it would be to unleash calamity upon yourself and the entire district. Well, look here. Little boys don't listen. No, it's not like I could avoid the damn tree either. Every direction I turn, even inside my own yard up on the slope, it was like the pear tree watching me over the fence. When Mrs. Warren sent me out, I pass by and the breeze make it call out to me when I was really just trying to go about my mother's business. Couldn't understand how a tree watered by the same holy sweet water river that my mother baptized people in could cause so much temptation. Mrs. Warren said that back in the 90s, when Jamaica Railway used to rumble through river gut, carrying people instead of bauxite, folks would pick pier and do brisk business with passengers before the train chugged back into the bush. But over time, the cargo turned pay dirt and the tree grew into a mystery. Anyway, follow me now. The same night after Mrs. Warren wagged her finger at me, maybe my spirit really did climb through the window and go down the hill because I dream I see myself over the barbed wire fence staring up into the avocado tree. And let me tell you, it was like the heavens open up and show me a vision like the prophet Ezekiel. Overhead, the Milky Way was shimmering as if God spilled salt over a marble kitchen counter. Every once in a while, a star would slip out of place and skid across the sky like a raindrop against a windshield. And the tree, hallelujah, the tree was heavy with avocados shining like they soaked up all of the sunset. So I pick a low hanging pear and strip off the skin and wolf it down with salt that I scooped off the sky. Well, no doubt Mrs. Warren hear me gobbling the imaginary avocado in my sleep because next morning she put down one piece of preaching up at the church. Yes, man. Shepherd mother set up a deliverance table that Sunday. Now, a deliverance table is not a normal thing at the Church of the Living Drum. When you see a deliverance table, it means there is a serious confrontation between good and evil, and Shepherd Mother was going to call for backup from the sky. Many congratulations to you, Roland, and a huge thanks to all our readers for their wonderful interpretations of these beautiful stories. I cannot emphasize enough that each of the five authors you've heard from today is a winner. Our judges, themselves from all five regions of the Commonwealth, had to go one step further. After hours of reading, discussing and rereading, they had to choose one overall winner of the 2021 Commonwealth Short Story Prize. Will it be Remy Gamiji for Granddaughter of the Octopus, Kanya Dialmida for I Cleaned The, Carol Farrelly for Turnstones, Katerina Gibson for Fertile Soil, or Roland Watson Grant for The Disappearance of Mumadel. The winner 
of the 2021 Commonwealth Short Story Prize is Kanya Dalmida for I Cleaned The. Congratulations, Kanya. Oh my goodness, thank you. Thank you so much. I, I'm, I'm lost for words. I'm not, I'm not. <laughs> thank you. Having had time to process even being shortlisted, and then winning the regional prize and, you know, talking to so many people about it. It's, it's like a double win for me because I really, I wrote this story for all the women who have taken their stories to the grave. And I just, I feel so, so privileged to be able to share even more of these stories with the world and, and just to encourage other women to tell their stories too. So it, it's it's really it's extremely special and gosh I'm I'm really moved I'm I'm really trying hard not to <laughs> break down in tears. <laughs> Thank you so much! Wow. Huge congratulations to you, Kenya. Congratulations also to all our regional winners as well as our shortlisted and longlisted writers. It's been a privilege to read your stories. As Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie said, when we read human stories, we come alive in bodies which are not our own. Don't forget submissions for the 2022 Commonwealth Short Story Prize will be open from the 1st of September 2021. So make sure you send us your stories. We'd love to read them. Maybe next year you'll be joining us at the awards. On behalf of the Commonwealth Foundation, Commonwealth Writers, and our friends here at the London Library, we wish you and your loved ones a happy and healthy year to come. We'll see you next year. Goodbye. If I can do it, it's something as corny as dedicate this award to someone, and feel free to cut this out if you, if you don't want to use it. But, um, my, my aunt was a, a huge champion of, um, of women's rights and especially uh, the rights of the mothers of the disappeared because her son, my uncle, was, was murdered in Sri Lanka uh, and he was a writer. So I would really like to uh, dedicate this to her. <laughs> <laughs>